be available uh, a little later in a follow-up and on our YouTube page. But with that, I'm going to turn things over. Good morning, everybody. It is a chilly morning here in Tallahassee. And I am trying to get my slides up. Can you all see those? All right. Uh, for those who don't know me, perfect, thank you. My name is Casey Shiley, and I am the Youth Services Consultant for the Florida Library Youth Program, or what we commonly refer to as SPLIT. Um, so if this is your first time on the line with us, thank you so much for spending your morning with us, and welcome aboard. Good morning. I'm Nancy Guidry-Hall, the State Data Coordinator here at the Division of Library and Information Services. And today we're going to be going through our summer library program statistics. So by the time we get done this morning, um, you should have a better understanding of the purpose of these statistics, how they can help you at the library level, and how we use them here at the state and up to the federal level. We're also going to cover the types of data that we are collecting when that data is due. I will talk a little bit about our outreach and marketing and what we collect as far as that is concerned. And then we'll also go through counting opinions, which is the system that you will submit your statistics through. And we will cover some frequently asked questions that we get every year. Um, just as a note, this webinar is really focusing on the statistics portion of the Summer Library Program. We're not going to be talking about actual program planning or programmatic ideas. Um, while we do talk about some programming to provide examples of the data we're collecting, we're not going to go too in-depth with that so if you're still looking for programming ideas we did have a webinar back in january that is available on our youtube channel and then we also uh, recorded several brainstorming sessions with uh, summer staff around the state so those are available on our youtube channel if you are still looking for programming ideas so with that we're going to talk about why we collect these summer stats and how they can help you on your local state and federal level so for your library specifically, uh, these statistics help determine the allotments. Um, and we give out allotments each year to libraries who opt in to participate. Um, and that allotment is meant to help you supplement your funding for your summer library program. So we take those numbers and we put them into a formula to produce that amount of money that you get each year. And so this year we are having some changes to our stats um, because with the changes that um, you know, have happened over the last couple of years. It has changed the way that we collect statistics. And so we're having to reformulate that formula to make it make sure that it is an equitable formula. And so you will see some of those changes as we kind of start to think ahead and how we can make these changes permanent um, and make that allotment work for everybody. These statistics also provide stories about your work and how you're meeting your community's needs. Um, that story is important to your library director. It's a story that you can take to your city or county commissioners and that you can share with other library funders and supporters. Um, and, you know, as staff who are responsible for programming, being able to track these numbers helps you all decide what your youth and families want when it comes to programming and resources and what they need. And then also, especially over the last few years with virtual programming taking a front seat, I know a lot of libraries have been able to use this data to identify groups of people that have maybe been unable to attend in previous years when it was just in-person programming. Um, and it's helped library staff identify gaps in who they're missing from their library. As Casey says, uh, the data collected from the summer programs survey is used for a couple of things. It's compiled for a statewide view of community needs, and this can help us spot shifting trends in the services that libraries provide. When we take these statistics and compare or combine them with other data collected throughout the year, it paints a broad picture of library service around the state, and we can then share that picture with our state leaders. The data is used for justification at the national level of this entire bureau 
uh, staff and all of our programs are fully funded by and so completely dependent upon federal funding through grants from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The IMLS has certain reporting requirements that are standard across the whole country, and these statistics help us meet those requirements. Just as all of y'all do at the local level, these statistics help us make the case for how beneficial and far-reaching our federal dollars are. We can show that Florida libraries are consistently impacting their communities through these personal stories and the numbers. Are there any questions at this point? All right. And if any questions pop up as we are going through, please feel free to um, either throw them in the chat or you can use that hand raise button. It's always good to hear other people's voices. So one of the, the big questions that we get asked pretty, pretty early on is when do you need to have your staff submitted by? So the survey will open on July 18th, 2022, and it will close on September 9th, 2022. Um, earlier or later last year, I sent out a poll across the state um, because I know that some of you had requested a later due date instead of August. Um, and so we put it out to a vote to the state and you all were overwhelmingly on the same page that you would prefer a later date, knowing that that means that your allotments will come a little bit later um, in the month versus getting it at the beginning of the month. So you do have a little bit more time with that. Although I do recommend that if you are able to, um, especially if you're from a, li a larger library system, maybe working on these statistics throughout the summer so that it's not one big job at the end of the summer. Um, and just as a side note, whenever I send your follow-up email with today's recording, I will also be sending out a one-page cheat sheet that has all of the stats on it, so you can print it out for easy access, especially because that survey is not yet open. Um, and then I'm also going to send out a Word version with the statistics in it, um, because I know for some of you that have multiple branches, it's easier to just send out a Word document so that your branches can fill that information out and get it to you for you to input into the system. So uh, what data do you need to collect? We're gonna give you a breakdown of the data that you need to collect for the survey and what defines a program and who you count as attending these programs. For the purpose of this survey, you're counting two types of programs, active and self-directed. Both of these categories combine all formats. They can both be in-person, virtual, or hybrid. Beginning this year, the take and make kits are going to be counted as a separate category. For active programs, active programs are conducted before a live audience. They can be interactive, but they don't have to be. They can be in-person, but they can also be virtual and they might be a combination with an in-person audience and an online audience viewing at the same time. The key qualifier for being an active program is being in real time. So on the flip side of that, uh, sorry, um, self-directed programs are not conducted before a live audience. Um, so the patrons, your community members, they can participate in these programs on their own timing. Um, they can be recorded live events that are put up for people to watch after the fact. Um, they could be a Twitter challenge that players can join over the course of a week. So there's a lot of different types of self-directed programs. Um, and just as with the active program, you count the number of programs and the number and the program attendance as well. So again, the key here is they are not in real time. So something that I want to make sure that we specifically point out, because um, we made this point the first year we started incorporating self-directed programs, but I think just over, um, you know, the chaos that has been the last couple of years, um, we have all maybe forgotten this piece about self-directed programs. Um, Pre-recorded videos can be counted only when the videos are recorded for your specific library. So if you are purchasing access through a mass license or a mass subscription, those videos do not 
count towards your stats because it's not a program that was created specifically for your library. Um, and so if, you know, let's say you have a juggler that you usually bring in, but they're not yet comfortable coming into the library for a, an in-person programming program, um, and they want to pre-record a video just for you, that you can count. Um, if you are just purchasing access to a video that somebody has created to send to libraries throughout the entire country, um, that is the type of thing that you would not count because it was not made specifically for your library. And there is a question in the chat about the date that the survey will open. Um, it will be open July 18th through September 9th. Okay, well, let's look at a, a few examples of self-directed versus active programs. Uh, one example is a scavenger hunt at the library. If you're just making the instructions and the list of items available for patrons to carry out at their own speed, that would count as a self-directed program. If you have a scheduled event with a time limit for participants to report back to a base to compare results, for instance, uh, that would count as an active program. For a book club, if you have a scheduled meeting where participants get together, either in person or online, count that as an active program. If they're just making asynchronous comments on Facebook, you can count that as a self-directed program. And it would be the same scenario, scenario for a story time. Um, if you have a gathering of a live audience in person or online or a combination of the two, it counts as active. If you're making a recording available, count the participants as part of the self-directed program. Take and make kits, or I know some libraries call these grab and go kits. Um, these have become increasingly popular over the last couple of years, and we've been including them in the self-directed programs uh, for the purposes of collecting statistics. So this year, we've actually broken this out into its own separate category. Um, so for those who have been doing this, um, you will still count it. You're just going to input it in as its own separate entity. Um, so activity kits, if you've not heard of them or grab and goes, they're just little sort of bags that staff fill with activities or crafts um, that patrons can pick up with them and take them home and work on them. Um, I recently picked one up from my local library for my daughter. It was about genealogy for kids, and so it had family activities um, that she could complete at home. And it was a fantastic, just quick thing that I could grab and bring home for her to do. Um, so it is new this year that we are counting these separately. Um, so you're going to count the variety of kits that you create, and you're going to count the number of kits taken by your patrons. And this will also be broken down into the intended age group as your other program programs are counted. So I'm, I'm a bit of a visual learner. Um, and so I wanted to provide an example because this is new in how we're doing this. So let's say that your library creates eight different take and make kits, but you put one type of kit out each week for patrons to take home. So you put 100 bags each week for eight weeks. And because this is a hypothetical scenario, we can make super neat and tidy numbers. Um, so let's say that patrons took 75 bags every week. So you would count this as eight different types of kits. And then the total number of kits taken was 600. And if your library does not offer these kits, there is a spot, and we will show that to you in a little bit, where you can just select not applicable. All right, let's talk a little bit more about virtual programming. And it definitely does count towards your statistics. Um, you count your live virtual events as active programs and count the attendees to the live events as active program attendance. When you post a video of a program, the views of recordings are considered self-directed programming. And then you count the views that watch the recording for one minute or longer. 
for live streaming, you should be able to see how many people are watching during the active live stream on your screen and be sure to record that total soon after the live view is ended. For the count of the self-directed recording views, wait until the end of the summer collection period to get the total number of views for each program you posted. For a program that takes place both in person and virtually at the same time, count it as one active program and combine both sets of participants. If the recording of that program remains available after the live event, those views that are one minute or longer would be counted as part of a self-directed program. So let's talk about outreach. Um, you would count outreach activities as programming. So I know some of you may have already started your outreach activities. So you want to make sure that you do include these because they do count towards your final statistics at the end of summer. And there's no set date to begin counting because I know that some libraries, as I said, have already started um, promoting their summer program and some will start before school lets out. So we do know that some of you are still unable to get out into your communities, um, but some of you have been able to start going out into schools or community activities. So do know that even if your outreach activities are still purely virtual, you can count those. Um, so if your team decided to live stream a commercial about your summer library program and y'all create a skit, um, that would count as an active program. And then for all the views that people watch after the live, that would be a self-directed program. Um, but in our digital age, it can be a little difficult to discern between what is outreach and what is marketing, because we do not collect marketing statistics at the state level. Now, you may decide that that's important to you all uh, locally, um, because it's part of your local story that you need to tell, um, but we, we don't need them up here. And so it can be difficult to tell the difference. And so the way I look at it um, and what helps me sort of visualize the difference is that virtual outreach is something that I could just as easily do standing in a room in front of a group of people. So for instance, the, you know, the live video commercial skit, that is something that could easily be done standing in a classroom full of kids. Whereas things like um, creating Facebook events or putting out digital flyers um, or sending out e-newsletters about your summer programming, that is more marketing. And those are the types of um, statistics we are not actively uh, seeking at this point. So just as a note about these statistics, um, uh, yes, Misha, I am still sharing slides. Can everybody else see them? No. Okay, some people can and some people can't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to reshare and see if that helps. Okay, hopefully that helped. All right, so whenever you are um, counting your programs, um, we do have them set up into different age groups and we will show you that breakdown here soon. But one thing that I think is important for you to remember is that um, you're counting these programs based on the intended target audience, not the age of attendees. So if you have 30 people show up for a preschool story time, 15 of them are kids, 15 of them are adults. It all goes in that preschool story time, zero to five age range. Uh, the other thing that I think is important to remember is that we are only counting summer library programming. And so um, I know that some of you continue your regularly scheduled programming and just carry it in through the summer. If that regular, you know, say it's a knitting club that meets once a month all year round, um, if they continue to meet, then um, you wouldn't necessarily count that as part of your summer library program unless they decided to incorporate that summer library program into their program. Same goes with your story times. If it's just business as usual, um, it's not really considered a specific summer library program. 
those statistics would go in your annual statistical report. Um, also, just as a side note, if you are still offering virtual story times for that zero to five age range, you could probably make the assumption that there is an adult watching alongside a really young child. Um, so you could safely go ahead and double that number for that age range specifically. That was a lot of information. Um, I know some of you are still having screen problems. Um, I'm not sure if our CE team can help with that um, because I'm, I'm showing that my screen is sharing. Um, if you continue to have problems, just know that we are recording this and um, you should be able to view it that way. Um, and I, I do apologize. I wish we had a quick fix for that. Um, that was a lot of information about different types of data. Does anybody have any questions at this point? And again, you can type any questions in the chat or you can use that hand raise button. All right, the next section is how to submit statistics. Um, we're going to give you a brief tour of counting opinions, and this is the instrument used to collect your summer program data. And a lot of you will be familiar with this. Um, this is the URL, and this will be sent to you along with your login information. There is one login per location, and this information should be kept confidential. The reason being, anyone entering information into counting opinions can overwrite data already entered. So if your library has multiple branches or multiple summer reading coordinators, be sure to combine all of your summer reading statistics and report them as a total. Each branch cannot enter separate statistics. Our system doesn't allow for that. Um, if you're part of a cooperative, who enters the data would depend on how your allotments are received. Um, a cooperative can decide to receive their allotments as a total, or members can uh, can receive separate allotments, and therefore you would enter your uh, statistics separately. And we will be sending out these logins and passwords no later than July 5th. So if July 5th comes and goes and you have not seen anything, um, make sure to check your spam folder. I tend to end up in people's junk mail a lot. Um, I'm trying not to take it personally. Um, and then if it's not there, make sure that you reach out to us so that we can ensure that, that you do receive that login information. If you are new in this position, um, please, and I will have my email address at the end, please make sure that you reach out to me ahead of time just to make sure that I have updated information um, I know we've had a lot of staff turnover across the state, um, so I've made a lot of updates already, but um, I know every year there's just new people coming on board that I, I miss. And so please make sure that you do reach out ahead of time so that you can get that information um, when I send it out. And then I also recommend that when you do receive your login information, even though it's ahead of that survey open date, that you will go ahead and try logging in just to make sure that everything works the way it should. We will be testing these logins, but you know what? Tech is gonna tech, and sometimes you can do all the prep you want, and um, you know issues will still crop up. So the sooner that we can solve those and resolve them, the better. And then Deb did put a question in the chat asking if I will send the slides. Yes, when I will send a follow-up email that will have um, a link to this recording as well as the slides and the different, um, the cheat sheet and the Word doc with the stats as well. The next screen is, is the login screen and after you log in, you'll see the welcome screen. There should be a blue enter button at the bottom. And this will take you to the page where you select the flip survey. And just a heads up about a potential glitch that we have identified in previous years. If you are the person in your library system who also logs into counting opinions for the annual statistical survey or any of these other statistics that we collect using a different login, 
sometimes counting opinions has the memory of an elephant. It never forgets. And so um, you may find that you have logged in with your flip login, but you are really staring at a different survey for a different login. Um, sometimes the system just gets a little stuck. And so I've had this happen in the past where, you know, I tried to log in to test Bay County's login information and it brought me into a Lachua's survey because they were the last um, account that I had logged in under. So if this should happen to you, there's two ways uh, to fix it. One is just to use a different browser. Um, that's probably the easier way um, to pull it up. Um, the other way, which if you're anything like me, I try to avoid this at all costs, um, is clearing your cache. Uh, one of those two seem to fix it pretty reliably. So if you run into that, we, we know we're sorry, um, but there is a fix for it. Another issue to watch for uh, when you get to the data input screen, it may be showing you last year's statistics. And if this is the case, it'll there'll be a bright red um, locked at the, <laughs> in the top right corner, and the date will show 2021. If that's the case, uh, click on the down arrow next to the 2021 and choose 2022 from the drop list. And when the page refreshes, you should be seeing empty boxes for this year with last year's numbers to the right. So here you can see how we have the age groups divided out. We have that 0 to 5, 6 to 11, 12 to 18, 19 and older, and then all ages. And the system will automatically total these up for you. So the nice thing is that you don't necessarily have to do that um, outside the system. So as a reminder, you're not trying to determine the age of attendees. This is based on who your target audience is. And sometimes, as we all know, programs can sort of fall in that in-between. So say you're doing a middle school program, that could just as easily be hitting an 11-year-old as it could a 13-year-old. Um, so whenever you, you know, kind of find yourselves in these in-between gray areas of age, um, Use your best professional judgment. Pick the one that you think most applies. I just then recommend um, that you are consistent. So if you're doing middle school specific programming, um, then you would need to make a decision locally if you are going to consistently count that as school-aged or consistently count that as YA. So at least there is consistency there. And then here is the new take and make section that we have added. So you can see that the age groups are the same. Um, and again, we have the total number of different kits. There's that not applicable box that you can check if your library does not even do this activity. And then you've got the total number of kits taken. And then I've circled that more um, because I wanted to draw attention that if you forget between now and then um, sort of what the parameters are for this. Um, you can click that more and it's going to have all the instructions in it. And this is the same for the other two sections as well. The next section is to indicate whether you use the available resources for your program planning. Um, there is an open ended comment space at the bottom. So if you didn't use the resources, please let us know why. And then we have our open-ended question section at the very end. And if you've been here, you're probably looking at this going, that is a lot bigger than it was last year. <laughs> and we did add um, three new questions. Two of them are optional. Um, and so the first question that we added this year that is new is how do you define success? Um, and I, you know, I'm really interested to know how you and your library consider yourself successful whenever you have finished your summer programming, because that's just going to help us help you more in the future. Um, the questions that we have that have been the same, uh, you know, what did you do differently this year? Please share any success stories from your summer program. This is by far my favorite section to read because you all do amazing things day in and day out. And so I love, it is always the first thing I go read whenever I download all of the survey results. And because we know numbers are only half the story, 
I take the information from these success stories to include in my report up to the federal government. Um, so the next question, what needs have you identified in your community and how can we help you meet those needs? This is another section that I really play or pay close attention to because it helps me um, identify future training needs, future articles for the Flip Forward newsletter. Um, so I do pay very close attention to what you all put in that section. There's a spot for anything else you'd like to tell us. Um, and then CSLP is always looking for feedback about the types of materials that they provide in the future. Um, and because they have to order materials pretty early on, it may take a year or two for them to incorporate that feedback, but they are desperately looking for it because they want to be able to best meet your needs. Um, and then optional question that we started including last year, and I got some great information from it, was um, a spot for you to provide either the number of books your community read or the number of minutes, or if your library is one of those that your log consists of different activities, um, how many of those logs were completed. Um, so this is just an opportunity for you to provide that information to us. So these two new optional questions. Um, the first one, what steps did your library take this year to ensure equity and inclusion in your program? Or what steps would you like to or plan to take in the future? I know that um, equity and inclusion is a huge conversation right now in library programming. I know some libraries are making it a point to include this information on their programming flyers to make sure that everybody feels welcome. Um, so I'm curious what your library is doing or what you're hoping to do moving forward. And then the other optional um, section down here is, um, you know, this past year, this past summer, I, afterwards, I put together a special summer edition newsletter sharing your stories and your unique program ideas. And I would really like for us to do that again. Um, and so I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell me what you would like for me to include, if you would like. Um, and because this is not really a, a point where repetition is necessary, um, if you put something in that, that question 25 about a success story that you would like to use, you can just feel free to put a note in there and say, hey, use the dog getting adopted story from 25. Um, but that would really go a long way to helping us make a great newsletter just to share your stories and what you do. And um, just as a technical note, when you're, especially when you're doing the open-ended questions, make sure you save often. I would suggest saving after each question and it, it might be less frustrating if you just uh, do your answers on a Word document and cut and paste in. Um, and then save, save often. Um, once you're finished entering all of the data, please lock your information. There is a uh, submit lock button um, at the top and the bottom of the survey. If your report happens to get locked too early or you need to revise something before the due date, contact one of us. Uh, we'll be happy to reopen it for you if necessary up until the due date. Once that happens, you cannot go back in and make changes. Are there any questions at this point? All right. So we did include some frequently asked questions that seem to pop up each year. Do we count passive programs? <clears throat> and yes, we do count them. We count them under self-directed programs. So we just use a different term. Do we count an activity as a program when a staff member is working one-on-one -on -one with a patron? And that depends. Um, no, if, if it's just an activity that was originally intended for one-on-one. -on -one. Yes. If you held a group program and only one person showed up, you do count it as a program. We've all had that moment where we've been left with 15 boxes of pizza and hmm. nobody to eat them. <laughs> yeah. 
So which social media video statistics do we pull? Because we know that stats look different on every platform and they constantly change. So if, um, if your particular platform has video views that are one minute or longer, that is the statistic we're looking for. Um, you know, those one to three seconds, we look at it similarly to if you had a patron who happened to be walking by your programming room and they pop their head in for just a second to see what was going on and then they continued on down the hall. You wouldn't count that person as being a program attendee. However, that's not always available. So just pull the number the platform has if you don't have that one minute or longer. Can we extend the due date? Um, sorry, no, the due date cannot be changed. All summer library program statistics must be submitted by September 9th, 2022 at 11.59 p.m. And just as a side note, um, I, I can promise you that neither Nancy nor I will be here <laughs> at September 9th, 11.59 p.m. So um, I definitely recommend not waiting until 11.59 p.m. just because if something goes wrong, we, we wouldn't be here to help fix it. So that was all of the information that we had for you all. Um, questions? Comments? As a reminder, if you have a mic, you can hit that hand raise button. Here's my contact information. It's my phone number and my email address. So if you have any questions that come up after the fact, um, or again, if you need to make sure that um, I have your contact information, if you are new in this stats position, um, please make sure that you reach out and let me know ahead of time. And this is my contact information. Um, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions, uh, especially about the data or about counting opinions. So that was all the information we had. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to hang on for another minute just to make sure if any questions come through. But other than that, um, thank you all so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come join us. And good luck as you finish prepping and planning for your summer program. Um, I cannot wait to see what everybody does. And Daryl also posted a link for a webinar survey. We are always looking to know how we can do things better and what we do that you like. So if you have one or two minutes to just fill that out, that would be great. Thank you, everybody.